Hello, everyone. A uh, very exciting moment, the first class of uh, systems biology. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here. I realize that um, this hall is too small for the number of people here. Uh, and so we'll, we'll try to look for a larger place. Um, if we need to. And you notice there, there was music playing when you came in. And in general, part of this course, talking about systems biology, is to remember that we're also uh, biological systems with uh, special needs. Like if you walk into a room with music, it makes you feel differently. Right? <laughs> and since our uh, objective here is to learn, to be concentrated and relaxed, We'll try to explore how we can do that together as, you know, um, being living organisms. It's not just the transfer of information, take care of the whole body. Now, I want to also start with um, introducing the first uh, feedback loop. We'll talk about feedback loops in this regard. So, you know, you might be familiar with our state as a human being called the relaxed state where we're uh, open, memory works, we're not worried. And this uh, comes together with um, many physiological changes, among them breathing. Like what's, what's the breathing like when we're relaxed? Deep and deep and slow, right? And it turns out, research has shown, that there's another arrow. If you breathe deep and slow, you increase the probability that you'll enter the relaxed state. And so we're going to um, experiment with this feedback loop during this class. And I'm going to invite you uh, to take a nice deep breath together. You don't have to, of course, but if you do, you'll have a good experience. The way it's, it's called a deep sigh of relief. You take in air and you let out a sound, like this. <sighs> So I want to invite you, whoever wants to, <laughs> together with me, to, make, to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> Good. <laughs> and we'll do that from time to time. So uh, on this side of the board, I'm writing uh, where we are. So we welcome <laughs> you and the breath. <laughs> My name is Uri Alon, and I'm uh, a professor here in molecular cell biology. I did my PhD in physics working on hydrodynamics and statistical mechanics. And then I got from a friend a biology textbook. And I didn't know anything about biology. I didn't know the difference between a protein and a... And the only thing I knew about proteins is what I read on a cereal box, you know, protein. <laughs> and I read this book and it was like reading a thriller because I was used to matter that... Um, you can describe using, you know, very well-established mathematical rules and equations and that behaves in kind of pretty predictable ways. But when you look inside biology matter, you see matter that dances. It's completely different. It looked to me. Th uh, inside our body, inside our cells, millions of times per second, these amazing structures form and then they do very precise functions, computations, uh, even though, despite the fact that they're in strong thermal fluctuations, they're very precise, and when they're not needed anymore, they go away. And this is uh, absolutely miraculous to me. I never saw anything like it, and I knew I had to study this. So I switched in my postdoc to uh, experimental biology. And the remarkable thing is that... Um, you can, as a physicist, as a scientist, find very satisfying new kinds of, kind of mathematical explanations and regularities in what goes on in biological matter. And this wonder is still with me every, or every day when I do research. And uh, it's also possible to teach it in a way that's accessible to an audience from many different uh, departments, like we are here. And my purpose is to share with you this wonder and to my goal is that at the end of this uh, few weeks we have together, I don't know, 12 weeks, you'll know how to 
take a biological system, understand uh, how to make a model that captures some essential features of it, use a little bit of math to analyze the model, and con concepts that allow you to generalize from one part of biology to many other diverse systems in biology on different scales. And uh, I think we can do it. This is the eighth time I'm teaching this course. I know we can do it. <laughs> <coughs> so, so if I were to say the premise of this course, what's the, the central goal or concept is that, um, I'm going to write it down. By the way, whenever you need to write a paper or give a talk or teach a course, yeah, it's very good ahead of time to think what the premise is. The one sentence that captures the idea, full sentence, that what you want to talk about. It's not so easy to define it, but if you do that, your paper or talk or course will be much more unified. So that um, uh, biological systems. Can be understood in terms of principles which we call design principles, which can unify different systems. <coughs> framework. <coughs> now, I told you a little bit about who I am and what the premise of this course is. Now I want to find out who you are. So I want to ask you some questions about who we, who we are. The first thing I'd like to ask is about the different uh, backgrounds that you come from. So how many people here uh, can identify as biologists? It looks to me like about half. Okay. And how many people here is physicists? So it's like a maybe a little bit less than half. And how many people here come from computer science? Okay, so about 5%, 10%. And from chemistry? Oh no, what will we do? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. And from engineering. What kind of engineering? <laughs> Electronic engineering. <laughs> Electronic engineering. <laughs> Electronic engineering. It's good because that's engineering is one of the big metaphors we'll use. <coughs> uh, anyone from a different background they didn't mention? No. And another question. So. I wanted just to notice, to note that we are, we, it's in one sense a challenge because we have, so, so physicists are used to one kind of uh, course, biologists to a different kind of course. Um, so you might, I might need to ask you for patience when I talk about something that's, that's really very basic for you because for the other people it's not basic at all. And uh, on the other hand, I want to point out that this actually is a big resource for us because in this course we'll try to get you to see if you can uh, learn from each other. And this whole field starts from people from different disciplines talking to each other. And what's easy for you is very difficult for the other person. And this is the way breakthroughs are made. So that's another purpose of this course, is to find these interdisciplinary connections. I want to ask a different question about the where you are in your uh, academic studies. So how many people here are first year's master's students? Okay, that's about, that's almost half, and second year master's students? Good, so we have a majority of master's students, I would say PhD students? 20%? I don't know. Uh, post PhD? One, two. Good. Postdocs? Almost. Almost? Starting, uh, this so transition between PhD and postdoc, and postdoc, Hannah? Hannah. <laughs> Professors? <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
We have people photographing us. Can you say your name? Itzik. Itzik. So thank you for <laughs> photographing us. And the purpose is to put this online, uh, which I did before when I taught at Harvard uh, in my sabbatical. <coughs> it's very, very much used resource. So and also you maybe will be able to use this if you want to remember what I said or find my errors, etc. And the last part of who you are, I'd like to ask you to turn, find somebody from a different background, and introduce yourself. done. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Always when I do this kind of thing to see people s tend to smile after talking to somebody new. Um, before we start talking about uh, an overview of the course, it's, it's I think it will be a good time to practice again, to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <laughs> so I invite you if you'd like to. <laughs> uh, all right, so what, what will we talk about? This, uh, so we have all this list of words here that we need to, by the end of this course, uh, cover this course, this lecture. <laughs> and I, you know, some people here, I just want to stress, people from biology background um, know very well the difference between these two words and in biology. So if you know very well the difference between these two words, could you raise your hand? That's a really majority. And I want to also I ask you to feel free to say, I don't know, because otherwise I don't know if it's teach you. So if you don't know in biology the difference between these words, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. And then there are other people here for whom it's very easy to uh, know by heart the solution for this equation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you do, can you raise your hand? It's not a test, okay, just for me to know. And if, if you'd like more to refresh yourself about math more, can you raise your hand? Or if you don't want to know anything about math, but you don't know the equation, you can So uh, I want to just uh, set your expectations. I, you learn, uh, people who don't know about this, you learn about these. You also, people who don't know, you learn about these. The, the level of the math in this, for at least the first half of the course, will be linear, partial, uh, ordinary differential equations, and then we'll go into more complicated equations. If you're the kind of physicist that wants a course with a lot of equations, it's not the course for you. But if you do want to learn how to take a complicated system and throw away the what's not essential, end up with a model that's useful, it gives you intuition, it is the course for you. So I just want to explain that. The, so the solution to this equation, um, and we'll use it today also. Okay. And we'll talk about this in a second. Again, I just want to make the, the sense that if you don't know either of these, you always have the person you just met to, to tell you. So uh, in this course, we're going to talk about uh, several uh, principles. It's organized by principles. The first part of the course, we'll talk about the brain of the cell, how cell thinks about its environment, quote unquote, represents the world and makes decisions. And the brain of the cell turns out to be made of a small set of recurring circuit elements. And we'll understand. In the second part of the course, we'll talk about robustness. This principle is, there's, uh, I this biological material, one of its properties is it's very, very noisy. It every, uh, some things in it can never be determined precisely. Concentration of a certain component could be 1,000 in one cell and 2,000 in its 
sister cell and can't do anything about it? How can we make a s s circuit three that can work precisely despite this inherent variability? And that constrains biology to very elegant and aesthetic designs. There are a very small number of them, which define, if you want to say, the manifold in which biological systems reside. That's the second principle we'll talk about, robustness. We'll talk about how a single cell evolves to a baby, an adult, with all these patterns, this beautiful patterning problem, and how it could be robust. We'll talk about error correction, information processing in biology, and we'll talk about optimality, how evolution um, can find solutions that are optimal and how we can use optimality as a principle to understand biology. So all, all these things are also a little bit different from if you're used to physics because evolution is at play and this uh, will create some shocks for you. <coughs> it requires a little bit of a different way of thinking. Good. And so let's begin. Maybe I should ask at this point if there's any questions. Yes. What about the course requirements? So what the question is what about the course requirements? <coughs> Good question. <laughs> So how many people here are actually signed up for the course? And how many people here are just to listen? So you're welcome to come. Oh, I didn't forget to say, how many people come from a different university? One, where you come from? Technion. Thank you for making all this way. Yeah. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> uh, this, is it, am I right? I live here. You live here? Yeah. Okay, still thank you. <laughs> 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 Honesty is uh, <laughs> highly... <laughs> uh, so uh, the requirements at this point, uh, I'd like to introduce Oren Choval, who will be the course teaching assistant. <coughs> Oren, is, is the one here? Yeah, so can you maybe okay. say a few words? Hi everybody. Um, so I'm Oren and I will be the teaching assistant, the TA. There will be uh, two... Um <laughs> so we have two, uh, at the beginning week or two, we'll see how it goes, but we'll have two, two separate uh, study groups. Uh, on Monday and on Wednesday, you saw that on the uh, find the website. And on Monday, between one and two, the group will focus more on studying or uh, repeating principles of biology. So for the non-biologists, and on Wednesday, a bit more focused on mathematics for the guys that are more biologists and want to refresh the exponential uh, uh, mathematics. Um, in terms of the requirements. Um, there will be a weekly uh, exercise starting from next week. Yeah. Um, again, the purpose is to know the material, not to test your uh, abilities. There shouldn't be two uh, things should be about an hour, something like that. Something yeah. should take you to an hour and two weeks. Is not, uh, That's the workload for you should be. <coughs> a, we uh, want to make it about an hour, two hours. Because I re recognize that a lot of you have a lot of course loads already. But if we don't have exercises, I think it'll be a shame. Yeah, and on the, <coughs> on the Feinberg uh, website, the there, will there is a class website. We'll post the exercises on there, and we'll have our details, and we'll have my email, and feel free to email me. And you know Would you I be able to yeah. write the email address? Yeah, I can write it down. Okay. You know, and <laughs> so uh, we talked about exercises and, and an exam, final exam. Any more questions about requirements? Percentage, percentage of the score? Uh, we didn't decide yet, so we'll, we'll let you know about percentage of the score. We don't know yet. What about books? Books, great question. Oh, so, so thank you. Yeah. So um, this book, we follow this book. 
and, and this book is I wrote this book based on the courses I taught I, the course I taught here again, again so after four times I wanted to have something organized so I wrote the book <laughs> and it's really very useful for me and uh, and I can I'm going to pass <coughs> it around we reserved uh, six copies in the physics library and six copies in the biology library and if there's not enough you, you should please let me know so I'm going to let you pass it around so you can take a look and <coughs> book yeah that's the book it's I think it should be enough it has uh, uh, some uh, terms and has some um, math at the back and it has uh, and today there's also Wikipedia is a huge resource people about biology you can just if you don't know a word you can find their good explanation so. more questions about structure good okay um, so we're I'll start start to get into our, our subject today our first subject Topic is the dynamics and response time of simple transcriptional interactions. So I to define the terms, etc. Um, we'll think about, for the purpose of this introduction, about the, one of the best understood organisms, a living cell. It's just one cell, unlike us, which are made of 10 to the 14 cells. This cell, this organism called, is a bacteria called E. coli. And its size is one micron, more or less. And it can do a lot of the functions of life. You give it some water with sugar and salt, and it <coughs> can divide, it can replicate itself <coughs> in an order of half an hour, make two, four, eight, sixteen, two, until food runs out and you can calculate it in, in a day uh, with this process you can get, if you didn't the food didn't run out you'd get, um, <coughs> well you can calculate how much, how many bacteria you'll get, it's an astronomical volume. Now, this bacterium is also uh, thinking all the time. It knows about the environment. It can detect things about the chemical environment and make decisions, change its composition in response to the changes in the environment. So we'll do a lot, talk a lot about how the cell thinks and what, what it, how it can store information and make sense of the world. Uh, it can move, it can put some food here. It'll grow propellers with electrical motors that spin at 100 hertz and move towards the food very efficiently. Um, go run away from toxins, etc. Communicate, cells communicate with each other. This little creature uh, is amazing in the amount of things it can do <coughs> that carry, uh, carry, and a lot of things about it are also applied to our cells. So it's one of the favorite organisms because <coughs> it grows so quickly and biologists have been able to uh, analyze it in great detail. Now, the interesting thing we'll focus about in E. coli, how it does all its uh, functions, if we look inside the cell, we'll see that it's a, it's a dense gel of the most important molecules we'll be talking about, proteins. So this is one cell. The next level of resolution is proteins which are molecular machines. I'm going to draw them like a Pac-Man here. It's almost, it's almost like an, a living uh, molecule. It's, its size is about 10 to the 4 uh, atoms, which na one nanometer. So you can fit a thousand from side to side. Kay. This is the scale. And these proteins are, uh, are the things that do things in the cell. They're the ones who build the parts of the cell. They're the ones who do the chemistry, breaking down sugars, taking the carbon atoms and making the rest of the cell. They're the ones who, uh, some of them are like antenna that are half outside the cell, half inside the cell and read what's going on in the external world. Some of them are information processing devices that can be mo chemically modified and then become active and chemically modify other proteins, forming circuits of information processing. They're the ones who bind to the DNA to, to control when other proteins are made.
carry out the functions of life. Mm -hmm. So, um, E. coli. So when I said the cognitive problem of the cell, is to uh, react appropriately to changes in the environment, in the world. Could be inside the cell or outside the cell. Now, what do I mean by that? When we supply a sugar that the cell can use to grow, cell makes a protein that can break down the sugar into carbon, right? Use it, use it up. So this is a uh, 1960s more or less biologist in Paris, Monon Jacob. This is the 50th anniversary of that actually figured out how this works. The basis of how it, it, this piece of information from the outside the sugar converts to an action which makes the protein that acts on this sugar in a useful way. That's or if the cell uh, is damaged, it, ma it, it senses it and it makes proteins that repair the damage. Or commit suicide. Like our cells, you know, when they're damaged, sometimes they commit suicide so we don't get cancer. Very important. This happens on the order of a million times a day, a second. The cells make the right decision in our body. It's very, we be very grateful for this, right? Well, we can. So I'm going to talk about um, a little bit of this cognitive problem. It turns out that the cell, uh, so you know, the chemical environment, the things can happen is, is infi an infinite dimensional space of So the, you know the the, the, the problem, the, the the world is can be tremendously complicated. There is many things that can change, temperature, pressure, many kinds of chemicals the cells can use or are toxic, etc. The cell is able to represent this better, represent um, the, the world using about 300 internal degrees of freedom. These are molecular states that uh, are the internal representation of what's going on in the world. One internal representation says, my DNA is damaged. Another internal representation says, oh, there is this particular sugar out there uh, at this particular concentration. And there's 300 like that in E. coli. There are the 300 transcription factors of E. coli, more or less. We'll talk, we'll talk about that. So, uh, yeah. oh, good. So first, I want to say our, our f this is not our first question. It's our first question about biology or <coughs> subject matter. So thank you for asking it. How did I come to the number three hundred? In a second, I'll talk about uh, the molecules that do these called transcription factors, and we know from the fully sequenced genome of E. coli every every single protein, and we know that about three hundred of them are transcription factors. And that's the number. Did I answer your question? Yes. No? No. Yeah. And what's the degree of freedom in this setting? Degree of freedom here. Uh, let, let me um, define it for you in a second. It's a concentration of a mole particular molecular species. I goes from 1 to 300.
So we'll, we'll uh, analyze this with this uh, example, supply sugar and cell makes a protein that can break down the sugar into carbon. So to understand that, we need to talk a little bit more biology. And what I'm telling you now is like very, very, very basic biology um, that applies virtually to all the kinds of organisms we know. So uh, inside E. coli is the DNA molecule. You've all heard of DNA, which stores the information needed to produce each one of the different proteins. This DNA is a molecule that is made of repeating elements. You all heard, I think, about these letters A, T, G, C, T, A. These four, it's a polymer made of four kinds of chemical letters. And with this, you can write uh, the instructions needed to make proteins. The number of base pairs in E. coli DNA is known precisely. In fact, we know every letter there. So it's, it's a polymer whose size is about five million uh, letters is the E. coli DNA. And it's organized into genes. Gene is a piece of DNA that encodes for one particular kind of protein. Of course, again, for biologists here, you'll recognize that every statement I say here has many <coughs> exceptions. For example, in our body, a gene can code for several proteins, the splice variant, etc. So we recognize that I'm uh, using a language that I hope uh, will be understandable to everyone and that captures the main, main part of the story. And this gene has, uh, can be read. And the way it's read, so how does this information turn into protein, is by pro a special protein. So DNA, in order to make meaning, has to be read by a protein. The protein reads the information there, and, and, and proteins end up making the new proteins encoded there in the, in the gene, you see. And the way this works is, Again, I'm just the basics. There's a special protein uh, that knows how to read a certain sequence of letters that tells it this is the start of the gene. <coughs> and then it starts taking this DNA running across the DNA and making another polymer that's just a copy of this DNA. This is like a little, it's like transcribing, this called transcription, the information there into a chemical note that soon will be thrown into the waste basket. But just for a little while, it has the information read in the gene. This process is called transcription. And this RNA, is then goes into a chemical, in a, into this huge protein factory, and here at Weizmann, you know, this factory, the ribosome structure was figured out by Ada Yonat, who won the Nobel Prize uh, in 2009. This is a huge achievement in biology to understand the factory in the cell that takes the RNA and makes, reads the letters, and understands how to link together a chemicals in order to make protein. This is called translation. So here, you know the difference between transcription and translation, right? We can congratulate ourselves. Of course, on a very superficial level, <coughs> still, that's, that's what it is. How many genes are there in E. coli? E. coli has about 4,000 genes. It has about 4,000 genes, and therefore we know it, has, it can make 4,000 different kinds of proteins. Some of them repair 
the DNA if it's damaged. Some of them break down the sugar. <coughs> Others make the cell wall. Others are in the ribosome to make new proteins. Others are special regulatory proteins that tell genes when to turn on and turn off, et cetera, et cetera. 4,000 <coughs> biological functions like this. Total number of proteins in the cell is about 3 million. Let's make it 4 million, okay? Therefore, on average, each protein is found at about 1,000 <coughs> copies per cell. How did I get this number? I just divided 4 million by 4,000 kinds of proteins. But again, there's a big, big range. Some proteins are found at just a few copies per cell, and others are found at hundreds of thousands, like the proteins of the ribosome, that's the machine that makes new proteins, are among the most common proteins. So there's a big, big range. If proteins are found at just a few per cell, let's say if I tell you there's 10 per cell, you already understand that there's randomness going on here, because 10 per cell, you can't have precisely 10 per cell. Some cells will have 5, some cells will have 15, there's Poisson statistics, when the cell divides, those proteins will go half and half. It's not five and five, sometimes it's six and four, etc. So I want to tell you already that for in <coughs> biology, you can't escape from the inherent randomness because you're always dealing with small numbers. There's only one copy of the gene, for example, and there's just a few copies of the RNA for each gene. So you go through bottlenecks of small numbers, and randomness, stochasticity, is built in. We'll get back to that later. This, by the way, is called the central dogma of biology, this transcription translation. Information flows from DNA to protein. It's in now, um, as I mentioned before about the cognitive problem of the cell, a protein, for example, the protein that breaks down sugar, particular sugar, <coughs> is not made all the time. It's only made when it's needed. It's only made where when the sugar is around. So how does that happen? How does that happen? And uh, the answer, uh, we already talked about gene. Um, now we need to talk about uh, what, what turns this process on and off, the, the switches. Switches are very important. So envir um, environmental signals, for example, sugar is present, um, affect regula regulatory proteins. So these are special proteins whose job is to turn genes on and off. And they're called transcription factors. I realize I'm telling you a lot of, for some of you, new concepts here, for some of you, very old concepts. And these transcription factors, this is a special protein. So for example, in the case of the sugar, we're going to write down in general, we're going to write down these signals as S. And uh, the signal for uh, regulatory protein X, we're going to call SX. And the sugar binds to this protein The protein is this molecule, right? 10,000 atoms. It's a very, very, it's a big molecule, but it's folded into a very precise shape that we can now know using X ray crystallography. So, you know. And this sugar, the signal, binds a specific place on this protein, and this protein is designed to go like that. It's like a machine that changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, it becomes uh, possible for it to do something new. For example, to bind to a specific sequence of letters on the DNA. So that's inside this protein is a lot of uh, cleverness. It recognizes specifically the signal and changes its shape in order to specifically recognize a piece of the DNA. So it's kind of a, a way to connect those, those worlds. And it when it's an active form, It, 
it can recognize its uh, binding site. Some sequence of letters, usually a palindromic sequence of letters, by the way, because they work in dimers. These details don't matter. And when, in it, when it binds to this, physically binds <coughs> here, it can activate this uh, protein to make, to transcribe. So when we add the signal, the protein switches to its active shape, binds the DNA, it starts transcription, and we get the protein. If we call this protein Y, we're going to summarize this entire molecular series of events in the symbol X arrow Y. X activates the production of protein Y. Now Y itself in some cases, is also a regulatory protein. It's also a transcription factor. And it goes to Z. And Z can, if it's a regulatory protein, can <coughs> activate W and U, et cetera. And so you can get a whole network of interactions like this. And in fact, that's what you do find inside E. coli. So there's a whole series of events that started by a signal allowing you to make quite sophisticated computations. We'll talk about um, Transcription factors and signals. Uh, this, this is the gene. The part here next to the gene where all the regulation goes on is called the promoter. This part of the DNA. So, you know, in the DNA there's parts that encode for protein and there's quite large parts they're there just to regulate how much and when this protein is made. And in fact, if you look at different organisms like uh, a human being and a monkey, the genes, the, that is to say, the kinds of proteins we make is virtually identical. And in the point, point of view of letters, 98% identical. And when people found that out, they said, wait, what's the difference between a human being and a monkey and a mustard plant? And it turns out that the fundamental difference is here, actually. When and where and how much is the logic or the computation. When and where and how much to make these proteins. We'll talk about that logic is very, very important. Okay. Um, I want to talk a little about time scales before I erase this. How long does each of these reactions take? And uh, here <coughs> in biology, we found, find something very, very useful, which is called, uh, known as separation of time scales. That each step here happens on a very, very different time scale. And for theorists, that means that you can average out the fast reactions when you're considering the slower reactions and make really much, much simpler models than you otherwise would have to do. So this active and inactive transitions take place on the microsecond time scale. When it's active, this protein diffuses in the cell or slides along the DNA to find its binding sites. And this takes, um, let's say, one second. Transcription takes 100 seconds. So you see the vast separations of time scales here. And then the protein is around, the lifetime of the proteins is around hours or days. So, um, again, so this separation of time scale, you can say, is this by chance or is this, uh, <coughs> yeah, how come we have this separation of time scale? And how does all this thing come around, about? I mean, how did this start? Yeah, uh, question? <coughs> You're right, yes. Yeah. Yes, here there's, there's no term separation of time scale. Or, uh, let's say. or we can say this whole, this whole step takes on the order, order of 100 sec a few minutes. 
Mm -hmm. Of course, this can change from organism to organism. There's a lot of complications that I'm not, I'm not talking about. Um, the e. coli, that's the situation. Promoter. How does th this whole thing, uh, how does this happen? How does, uh, it's quite uh, miraculous, in fact, to, 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 rem to remember that these cells, E. coli, are uh, living organisms and they are um, made or they, they change by a process of natural selection that Darwin talked about in 1860, he wrote his book, right? 1860 something. And the idea is that when E. coli divides, makes a, a baby, makes exact facts, it duplicates itself, also duplicates the DNA precisely. So again, <coughs> exactly 4.7 times 10 to the 6 letters, exactly, exactly copied correctly, duplicated, with an error rate of 10 to the minus 9. That means to say it takes a thousand duplications before you get a, 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 a change. But changes still occur. And if that bacteria has a change somewhere, for example, a letter here that changes the shape of this protein eventually. And usually this is uh, bad news for this bacterium. And that bacterium with the change, that mutant, uh, doesn't reproduce as much as the other bacteria and this change is lost. But sometimes uh, it's an improvement under the particular conditions the bacteria lives. And that improvement therefore makes that bacteria makes a little bit more babies and that piece of DNA replicates more and so these changes are kept and that's how by this process, believe it or not, you get all of these 4,000 genes, promoters, the right place, the right time, bacteria became multicellular animals, fish, reptiles, mammals, sh monkeys, <coughs> humans, uh, this at an accelerating pace Evolution worked <coughs> took about a billion years to go from uh, bacteria to more complicated organisms. So nucleus, another half a billion years to multicellular organisms, and then another, um, I don't know, quarter of a billion years to get to complicated animals, and then an humans diverged from monkeys a few million years ago. <coughs> it's, it's, it's accelerating the pace of what we might look at as the increasing complexity and something like that. So that's something to understand. By the way, a lot of things are open questions, how this scale of evolution works, complexity, build, etc. So there's a lot in, in this field, <laughs> it's like we know the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot, a lot to discover. I want to also tell you that right now. Okay. So this is about natural selection, just, just a small uh, taste of it. <coughs> mm -hmm. Questions, yes. Um, the reason for the many colleagues in the cell are also <coughs> aerobic statistics when the RNA translates into the protein, or is there any other reason? I mean, they are all used for breaking the sugars, or oh. there is some other reason for the genes? So, am I right in asking, are you asking why there are so many proteins, 4,000 kinds of proteins in the cell? Is that what you're asking? Not the kind. I mean, for a certain kind. For one kind? Yeah. So for instance, the, the, the protein that breaks down the sugar, why do we have about a thousand copies of it? Why not one? Okay. So that's, that's a very good question. The amounts, <coughs> the concentrations of these proteins are also um, quite well determined by natural selection and they're determined usually uh, according to what they need to do. So think about the protein that needs to cut the sugar. It needs to produce enough carbon atoms to make a entire new cell in 30 minutes. Now each one of those proteins works, let's say, 100 times per second, producing 10 car new carbon <coughs> atoms for the cell. Now you can calculate how, how long you need to work in order to produce the 10 to the 12 carbon atoms in the cell. 10 to the 12, I think, is the right number. Uh, there's 10 to, the 10 to the 6 proteins. Each one has about 100 amino acids, each one of which made made of, let's say, 10 carbon atoms. So, so no, no, maybe it's 10 to the 9 carbons that you need. I have to check that. <coughs> so it turns out, when you do all the calculations, that you need, for that sugar-cutting enzyme, almost 100,000 copies. 
that's how much the cell makes. If you have less sugar, it makes less of it. So I'd like to tell you that the amounts made also depend on this, the intensity of the signal. And that function is itself under natural selection. And uh, as I'll tell you towards the end, you can, from optimality arguments, calculate sometimes mm -hmm. how much the protein should be in the cell. Mm -hmm. That's true for E. coli. The amounts of proteins in our cells, it's still under debate wh whether there's the cell cares if you take away half of them or not. So. <coughs> Did I answer your question? <coughs> Great. So very, very good questions. I want to encourage you to ask questions, mm -hmm. especially questions when you don't understand something. You're helping uh, other people who don't understand probably the same thing at the same time. Uh, super, super. We're making excellent pro progress. Um, before we take a break, I want to draw for you the uh, upshot of what I just said about X arrow Y. E. coli has a transcription network made out of etc. Uh, with about 300 transcription factors and about 10,000 arrows, where the arrows mean transcription factor X, transcription factor is 4,000 nodes. Each node is a protein. <coughs> 300 of them are transcription factors, or regulatory proteins that are able to change the production rate of other proteins. So three o 300 of them have arrows going out of them. And there's about 10,000 arrows. So um, this is the brain we're going to discuss. And because we're working in E. coli, we know the shape of the brain. We know each and every interaction to first approximation. Who talks to whom? So we have an object here of high complexity, carries out very important functions for the cells, figuring out how to change the cell's composition in response to the environment. And we have a chance to do something that I think is the first time in science, to understand an object of this complexity. Because, you know, a network of nonlinear interactions with, ten th with you know, a few thousand variables <coughs> is impossible to understand. A generic network is impossible to understand with all these equations. But because it's an evolved network, we'll see that it's special, it's biological. Biological networks are simpler than the generic case. And they have, they have principles, because they've evolved, that actually make it possible <coughs> for human beings to understand them. That's deeply satisfying. That's, that'll be a, a big part of the first third of the course. I think this is a good time to, to take a break. We'll come back at 3.20. So uh, it looks like there's a, a creation of free seats. So people, uh, if you want, if you want to sit more comfortably, there's one there and two there. And for you guys, there's a few over there. Yeah. There's three seats here, for example. I think there are you. Ah, they're not three. Not free. Thanks. We're passing out a uh, form. You can please write your name, email, and if you are registered or not to the class, because you need to know the email we were sending out can find will reach everybody. So we're going to send so uh, especially some. Especially those that are not registered, make sure you write your email clearly. So we c so we can get some materials that we'll send. Yeah, we can do it. Um, <laughs> Good. So um, let's begin by taking together a nice deep sigh of relief. Um, you know, uh, so we're going to talk uh, soon about the dynamics and response time of uh, 
one arrow like this. Uh, and we started talking that, you know, the, the genes have their, this, this complicated uh, series of events where the transcription factors become active, diffuse, bind the particular site, just maybe 10, le 10, 20 letters inside this, millions of letters in front of the gene, start transcription translation and make a protein. <laughs> this uh, stuff is summarized by one le le letter, arrow, X, arrow, Y, X um, <coughs> changes, I need a different... Marker. Huh? <coughs> Production rate of protein Y. So uh, make it bigger letters. Yeah. Uh, by the way, there's another ritual I want to tell you about. Uh, when people come in late, which is fine, we welcome them with a nice deep sigh of relief. So let's welcome them with a nice deep <laughs> sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> that way we're going get, to get to breathe a lot, which is <laughs> very, very good. Again, the purpose is not to, uh, not to uh, humiliate anyone. It's just that when something happens in the class, we all notice it. And if we just uh, recognize it, since again, we're human beings, we can, uh, it's it just feels better. Yeah. About size considerations, the sizes of protein versus the size of the cell, and how do you fit uh, a million of them in there with the DNA and still leave room for things to move around? So great. So the question is, I told you the size is one micron and the size of the protein is one nanometer. How can you make fit a million proteins into this um, membrane enclosed capsule? Uh, and indeed, um, if you this E. coli is one, th th this dimension is about 0.1 micrometer. So the volume of this is about 10 to the minus 2 micrometers cubed. And that means there's room for about 10 to the 7 nanometer cubed proteins. Because uh, this is 1,000th of a micrometer. So it's 1 billionth of a micrometer cubed is the one protein. And we have 10 to the minus 7 nanometer cubed. And what the, the result is that the cells, just as you suspected, are are densely packed with proteins. It's not a dilute gas of proteins that bump into each other in the DNA like in an uh, ideal gas. This is like this. A uh, cell is, is um, volume fraction of proteins is very high, like close to 50%. And the DNA is a tiny, tiny part of that um, volume fraction. If you take the DNA of the bacteria and stretch it out, it will be much larger than a micron. It will be I don't know, a thousand times longer than the cell. It's coiled, 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 coiled like this. And everything is very packed. So the proteins are moving like this and still need to find that piece of DNA in the right search around among the millions of letters for their letter. How can it happen, in, like I told you, in a second, 10 seconds? It's good physics problems, right? So a lot of this has been worked out before. A lot of, a lot of things are less understood. It's, uh, we can talk later about diffusion constants inside the cell, etc. But it's a non-trivial, crowded environment in there. <coughs> Can I answer your question? And thanks for asking it. Uh, you asked me during the break, and I wanted you to ask here because... Uh, anyway, I want to encourage you guys to ask uh, if you don't... if something is bothering you or don't understand. Because that means it helps, me it helps me explain better. Um, just a few more details about this brain. What we know is that there are of this brain, or the transcription network. There are uh, two signs, possible signs on the arrows. Uh, positive and negative. Positive means X increases <coughs> the production of Y. And negative means X decreases the production of Y. By the way, you can write, if, if you help you remember, but uh, Everything I'm saying is, is, is also in the book, if, if you want to just not write. It's also a good option. Um, and and our, our, s our symbols for activation, we have a special symbol for this decreasing thing, is this is for the positive interaction. And for negative, we use this kind of sign. It's like an arrow like this. This is for x decreases the, pr the production of y. X's like this are called activators. 
and X's like this are called repressors. Just more words. And we know that an E. coli network there are about 50% activators and 50% repressors and in E. coli and in human beings it's about 80%, 20%. And by the way, in another kind of biological network, neuronal networks where X is neuron cells and this is a synapse in neural cells, there's also 80% more or less activating and 20% inhibiting interactions. Is that a coincidence or not? We'll talk about later. Our brains, of course, have many more than 4,000 nodes. Our brain has, you know, <coughs> how many neurons do we have? 10 to the 11? 10 to the, 10 to the 11 neurons. Uh, this brain has only 4,000 nodes, and 300 of them are the ones that uh, activate and regulate, so it's, it's smaller. It's, it's, more, it's a good place to start. Um, the the signs on the outgoing arrows from a transcription factor uh, usually have the same signs. Outgoing arrows <coughs> are usually all plus or all minus. If X is activator, all plus. If X is a repressor, all minus. The incoming arrows to a given node are mixed usually. Incoming arrows. Are, are of mixed signs, mixed plus, minus. This property also happens in neuron net neuronal networks. The outgoing connections of the neuron cells usually have the same effect because of the kind of neurotransmitter they have. The incoming have different effects. That's called Dale's rule in, in neurosciences. Same thing in transcription factor networks. <coughs> so the comment here is there are transcription factors that could be both activators and repressors. Absolutely right. So uh, some set of X can also repress some specific genes. Absolutely right. So let's, let's make it more precise. They have correlated, correlated sign, mostly plus, and these are less correlated. Yeah? When you say increase production, increase production, production rate or the number of? When I say increase production, I mean increase production rate. So, you can't, so it doesn't decrease the population of Y, it decreases the, per the rate, the rate of, of production. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And that's something we'll talk about now. Huh? When you change the rate of production, what's the dynamics of the change of the concentration of the protein Y? That's exactly what we'll talk about in this lecture. Absolutely. Yeah. Good comments. All right. Um, when two inputs go into the same, into the same node, Interesting things can happen, for example, we'll see later that they can act as AND gates. You need both of these inputs, X1 and X2, to be active. They can act as OR gates. Either one is enough in order to change the production rate of the gene. They can be more complicated functions. We'll talk about that later. But genes that have two different transcription factors, for example, this is first signal, this is second signal binding to their own, each one to its own site, can act together as AND gates, OR gates, other functions, and that's a lot of where the information in animals comes from, which cell will become a brain cell, which cell will become a muscle cell, why this makes muscle proteins, this makes brain proteins, at a particular place at a particular time, determined by the logic on the promoter, that piece of DNA that controls how much of that transcription factor we make in the developing embryo, which changes the signals have to do with where that cell is and the transcription factors make this computation. And so this carries through to very profound things about, uh, about our biology too, not only in E. coli. Of course, our biology much, much more complicated, but principles are very s carried through. And one more thing I'd like to tell you about this is <laughs> that the design here, this design promoter gene this design is highly modular or if, if you want to call it plug and play I can take 
a piece of um, DNA from a jellyfish. And that piece of DNA makes the protein that makes this jellyfish green fluorescent. It's the gene called that makes the protein green fluorescent protein. So I take just this part, gene from the jellyfish that encodes <coughs> green fluorescent protein. And using the tools of molecular biology, which are extremely powerful, every lab here at the Wolfson Building has the technology to take that piece of DNA and glue it into the DNA of E. coli, precisely glue it into E. coli DNA uh, next to, let's say, a sugar controlled promoter. So this is genetic engineering. I'm taking a piece of DNA from the jellyfish and I'm combining it with a piece of DNA from E. coli. And what do you get? You get E. coli that turns green when you add sugar. It's a seamless modular design. E. coli turns green when you add so uh, you can also ask, this all evolved by these random mutations, random letter changes that select for, and then the E. coli, the cell that more babies, survive, etc. How does this get you to this modularity design? Why shouldn't it just change for each organism has its own machinery, specialized machinery? What, what, what keeps it uh, like that, that jellyfish and E. coli that have diverged two billion year, years ago? They're the last common ancestor. Why should it be that their genes work in each other? And that's that's a very, very interesting question. It has to do with uh, things like evolvability, the ability for organisms to change. So this modularity affects a lot, the ability to recombine parts, just like we have in electronic engineering. Plug and play elements make, make allow us to make engineering much, much, much quicker. We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time, right? There was a question? Uh, so you mentioned earlier that major differences between, say, humans and apes are in uh, regulation. Um, and then you just said that, that genes, the mechanism for translating genes is con highly conserved across all organisms. How conserved are, are the mechanisms, of, for example, of promoting promoter expression? Like, is that also conserved highly? Or the how so the question is, so how si when you say conserved, is that the word that says how similar between different kinds of animals and organisms is the... Is the promoter mechanism, like if I take it's a promoter from a jellyfish, will that work? Ah, so the question is, the converse experiment. If I take this, the regulatory piece of DNA from jellyfish, and I stick it into E. coli in front of a, a gene from E. coli, that won't work anymore. Because E. coli doesn't, ex doesn't make the regulatory proteins that can recognize the jellyfish signals. How far away do I have to go at, at, like, if I do it to another bacteria, will it so the question is, how far away on the tree of life can I go before uh, promoters start losing their uh, spe special tip? So um, I don't know the answer, and uh, that's a nice research question. So here we, we are uh, touching the boundary of the unknown, at least the unknown to me, let's call it. Um, and by the way, I think that will be nice for us. I think a lot of your questions will generate things that we just don't know. I don't know for sure, but maybe even... So I want you to get the, the, the message that it's a very fresh, fresh, fresh field. More, less known than still to be discovered by some of you, maybe. All right. Um, now let's, let's uh, talk about dynamics and response time. So uh, I'm going to erase this, uh, uh, this, chemis this piece of biology, and we're going to... Uh, think about just out of this whole network where we're just going to take x arrow y and analyze its simplest dynamics in the simplest case to get a sense of time scales. <coughs> and by the way, this lecture is unusual because I told you a lot of uh, biological words, but next lecture, that's it, more or less. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work with this for a while. I think, um, description now. I think all th these words are what we need for the first third of the course. 
more or less. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about um, x and y, and we're going to calculate the uh, dynamics of the concentration of protein Y, which will denote as Y of T in the cell. So, um, <coughs> I want to write down the equation for the rate of change of y. And that equation is very simple. It's a first order rate equation. It's the rate of change of y. This is the production rate. And in general, it's a function of how much active transcription factor X I have in the cell. If <coughs> X is an activator, beta will be an increasing function. And if X is a repressor, beta will be a decreasing function. We're not going to worry about that right now. We're going to make beta constant <coughs> soon. Here. This is the removal rate. And it's the rate at which uh, protein Y uh, concentration goes away. And this removal rate is made of two processes. Degradation and dilution. Degradation is the active destruction of Y. So the cells know how to make machines that take protein and <coughs> cut it up at a certain rate, alpha deg, and you see it's a first order process. It's just like radioactive decay. There's a probability per unit time for Y2. And dilution is the reduction due to cell growth. So because concentration is the number of proteins divided by the volume of the cell, if we didn't make or destroy any proteins, but just increase the size of the cell by growth, concentration would go down. That's what's called dilution. So this is a very good comment. The comment is that this equation means that a change in X star, the active transcription factor, leads immediately to a change in production rate. Whereas uh, in the scheme that I showed you, the central dogma, the central dogma, the there's <coughs> delays. So it takes a microsecond for the signal to change X star, then about let's say seconds to find the DNA, then minutes to uh, produce protein Y. So that's the production rate maybe order of magnitude of seconds, et cetera. And here, thanks for this question, because I didn't explain this well enough. I'm using separation of time scales. So I, what I'm doing here, here is physics' the favorite topic, is to neglect some of the complexities of the real world in the, um, in the hope that you get a model that, that can make enough intuitive sense that you can go back and understand. So I'm going to write it down. I used used separation <coughs> of time scales to write an equation um, where a change in x star 
it makes an instantaneous change in <coughs> beta production rate. A more real, more realistic <coughs> model would have, uh, let's say, equations for RNA for binding of X star, etc. All these are on the are 10 to 100 seconds time scale, but changes in Y we'll see are order of magnitude faster. Or more. So I'm going to neglect these and assume they're instantaneous on the time scales we're talking about. It's a very important uh, point. Uh, and of course, in the homework assignments, you'll be able to write the second order equation. That's the kind of thing that you can do. Yeah, good question. Um, Why yeah. <coughs> Why don't you consider the degradation of X on the production? Um, Right, there's a separate, the question is why don't you consider degradation of x? There's a separate equation for x, and that's going to change this as a function of time. And that means this, this thing can be a function of time, then we need to solve this, and it's possible to solve. I'm assuming going to solve it, assuming x is constant, like in an idealized situation. Did I answer your question? Good, 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 good. Um, yeah, can we go on? Great. We're <coughs> We're going to make it. <laughs> so, um, <coughs> so we're going to solve this equation. And the first situation is um, case one, um, steady state. So beta has been constant for a long time. Y no longer changes. So dy dt is equal to zero. And then we can solve this. And we find that Y steady state is beta over alpha. <coughs> so wha what does this equation tell us is that at steady state, nothing's changing. The amount of protein we find is the ratio of production to removal rates. If I double production, I double Y steady state. If I double removal, I half Y steady state. Okay, case two. Suddenly, beta becomes zero, even though I started at y equals y steady state. So I've, for a long time, I had the sugar around and made the protein, and now the sugar is gone. Maybe all the cells ate it up, or I moved to a new place, etc. What's going to happen to the protein concentration? It's no longer produced. So it'll just be removed. <coughs> Solution for this equation, like I wrote down in the first lesson, in the first part of the class, is an exponential decay. The rate of this exponential decay is given by the d removal rate, just like in radioactive decay. I'm going to plot it out here. Can you see the Mr. Camera? Yeah. Time. Y of t. Concentration versus time. We start out at y steady state. And it looks like this. Doesn't reach zero, of course. <coughs> I want to introduce so we talked about degradation, steady state. I want to introduce this concept of response time. This concept actually comes from engineering. Response time tells us how quickly things happen in a dynamical system. Response time is the time to reach halfway 
from initial to final level in general. So we could ask, what is the response time in this simple case? We need to calculate it. So the question is, when do we start from, we start from Y steady state, and the response time is the time to reach Y steady state divided by 2. This is what we call T 1 half. So let's solve it from our solution here. <coughs> so y of t one half is one half y steady state. That's equal y steady state e to the minus alpha t one half. I plugged in t one half here. So y steady state. It doesn't matter what y steady state is. The answer is that t one half is log two over alpha. I'm going fast with the math. I, I suggest you um, try it out af after the class. Now, what does this mean? Here, this means that the, the, the time it takes for the, for the protein to go away half to half where it started is governed is inversely proportional to the removal rate alpha. The faster I remove the proteins, the faster they go down, of course. But it is independent on the production rate, beta. Of course, there's no production rate in this situation because they stop production to zero. Just depends on that. Uh, it's important to me for me to say that, um, and this we'll use later, Most E. coli proteins have no degradation or degradation alpha deg is much smaller than alpha dilution. That's to say, over the times where cell grow and divide, these proteins are stable. So that alpha is alpha dilution. And I just want to tell you that what this means is that the response time, which is log 2 over alpha, is equal to one cell generation. Let's say about 30 minutes to a few hours, depending on how much sugar there is around, etc. How, how do I know this? <coughs> the reason is very simple. If I have a protein that's not actively destroyed, it's just diluted out by cell growth. And I start with a cell. Now I let it grow to twice the size, and it divides. That protein, which started at a certain amount, now divides <laughs> half and half into the two daughter cells. So after one cell generation, its concentration in each cell is now half of what it started with. If there's no degradation, after one cell generation, which means I started from a cell, it grew to twice the size, and then split into two cells. This is one cell generation, right? This is 30 minutes. You have half in each cell, half of what you started with. In other words, alpha dilution is log 2 over the generation time. And that is, the cells, by the way, their volume grows exponentially until they divide. They grow exponentially until they divide. And that's true also for our cells. They grow exponentially and divide to grow exponentially. One second. I, I have, I'm a kind of, can't take a question right now. So this is actually quite slow. It means that you have to wait a few generations to get rid of this protein. What about the case where you start producing? What's the response time when you start producing a protein? 
response time is important if you want fast responses. Organisms sometimes want. <coughs> Case three, start with y equals zero and suddenly increase beta. So beta, the production rate, at time t equals zero, starts reaching from zero to a value, certain value. The solution of the equation in this case <coughs> is this, which you can verify by taking the derivative of this function <coughs> by time, so the derivative of e to the minus alpha t is minus alpha e to the minus alpha t. Because there's a minus here, it's a plus, and beta over alpha cancels the alpha, and you get this equation. Let's plot it out. It looks like this. At long times, when t is very long, e to the minus something large is zero. We're left with beta over alpha, which is y steady state. Good. So we have, <laughs> have to go. Bye-bye. Uh, we, we reach the steady state. That's good. What, what, what about in the beginning? In the beginning, this slope here is beta t. You can uh, do the Taylor expansion here and see that in the beginning, this looks like beta t. So production rate is this slope here. So as proteins get produced, until there's enough of them where removal balances production. That's what's happening. What's the response time? So we reach y steady state over 2. This is, right, is y steady state, 1 minus e to the minus alpha t1 half. And if you solve this equation, you find that t1 half is exactly the same as this t1 half. So the halfway point here does not depend on production rate. Production rate, if I increase production rate, it increases the steady state. But the time to reach halfway to that new steady state doesn't depend on production rate. It only depends on removal rate. Now removal rate is slow for a stable protein. No matter what, log 2 over alpha, for these cases of activating or deactivating the beta, is slow. What do I mean by slow? About one cell generation for most of E. coli's proteins. What does that mean? It means that if I, uh, let's say I have some damage and I want to repair it quickly and I want to make a lot of proteins, it, I don't, it takes for my daughters and granddaughters, only they get that amount. Now since again we're living organisms, that could be a disadvantage. So the question is, is there a way to overcome this? This uh, response time of course is the eigenvalue of this dynamic equation, so you can't play around with that too much. You can, of course, increase the destruction rate, the active destruction rate, make degradation, destroy the proteins. That means to reach a certain steady state, you need to make more of the proteins, <coughs> which is uh, cost energetically costly. So you can make what's called a feudal cycle, which is make a lot and break a lot, make a lot and break a lot, whose payoff is faster response time. But if you're limited for resources, that's not a very good solution. So are there ways to get around this response time? And the thing we'll do in the next class is look at some circuitry, part of that network that I showed you, that can speed up the dynamics. Okay, so I invite you all to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and I'll see you next week.